it is hot out there. It is Texas in the month of August, and so that is brutal, back-breaking work. Uh, and you're doing it in Travis County, <laughs> uh, which may not be the most conservative county in Texas. But, but, but thank you. It, it makes a huge difference. Look, the, the strength that our campaign has had from the very beginning has been the grassroots. It has been young people. It's been small business owners. It's been Republican women. It's been the homeschool community. It's been conservative grassroots that were fed up with Washington and politics as usual and had wanted to do something to change it. And this is a volatile political time. We're a deeply divided country. It, it, it is painful to see the divisions that are playing out, uh, to see the, the anger and the rage and the hatred that we see spilling out each and every day. And, and, and I'm grateful for the work y'all are doing to try to bring us together. The work y'all are doing to try to mobilize and energize and turn conservatives out. This election, it's clear there are a bunch of folks on the far left who are filled with fury. And are going to show up. We're going to see record-shattering Democratic turnout in November. But the good news is there are a lot more conservatives than there are liberals in Texas. Our task is real simple. The danger is not, I don't think a bunch of conservatives are going to wake up suddenly and vote Democrat in Texas. The danger is that we stay home. You know, the anger on the far left, we underestimate that at our peril. Anger is a powerful political motivator. And it helps right now keep the Democratic Party together as they're galloping so far left it makes your head spin. On our side, the danger is folks are a little less committed. The urgency is a little less. They feel a little bit demoralized, unhappy, content. They may be unhappy at one thing or another thing. And the way we lose Texas is one slice stays home for one reason, one slice stays home for another reason, a third slice stays home for another reason. That's how you end up losing Texas. Now, I don't believe that's going to happen. But it is the men and women and the boys and girls in this room who are the bulwark to prevent that from happening. But it's powerful and effective when you go and knock on a door, when you're taking your time to say, you know what, this election really matters to me. This matters to my family. This matters to my kids. This matters to our freedom. This matters to Texas. That's, you know, people are understandably, they get skeptical of, you know, gazillion TV ads and political ads. You know, pe people are naturally skeptical. There's nothing as powerful as, as listening to another Texan, listen, looking someone in the eyes and explaining, hey, this is why it matters to me. So thank you for what y'all are doing because it makes a huge difference. Now, I had a seven-hour speech prepared for <laughs> but, let's learn something. But, but let me suggest instead of that, let's just open it up for questions. I'm happy to answer anything you guys like. Uh, Senator, yeah, I have a suggestion. There is this hashtag walk away. Yes. Um, I think if we put that on all the Republicans' websites, like, that would help people not to vote Democrat. H have you seen, there's a video, I saw it on Brightbook part, that was done of a uh, young man who was gay and, and a liberal who did this long video advocating walk away. Yes, Brendan Strzok. Oh, is that? That's him, yeah. Okay, it's, it's a, it is a remarkable video. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, a, a friend emailed it to me a few days ago, and it really is powerful, where he's calling out the extreme intolerance uh, of the far left and why he's walking away. I, I agree that that, as we see this, the National Democratic Party get more and more extreme, they're telling more and more Texans that they're not welcome in their party. And, and I do think that's an opportunity for us to be... Look, I've never agreed with some... Some politicians like to beat their chest and say, I'm the most conservative person who ever lived. Yeah. Attila Bahan, he was a squish. <laughs> You know, my political role model has always been Ronald Reagan. And Reagan never once talked about how 
value is a big, scary concern. Reagan just said, you know what, I, I believe the same common sense principles that every small town, that small businesses, that families have understood for centuries. That's exactly what we're talking about. Look, what this race is about is low taxes, low regulations, more jobs, higher wages, more opportunity, securing our borders, and defending the Constitution, protecting our the Bill of Rights, our fundamental rights, whether it's free speech or religious liberty or the Second Amendment or the Tenth Amendment. Those are common sense principles that unite the vast majority. And, and our task, now listen, the mainstream media is going to do everything they can to paint everyone in this room as crazy, scary people. Because fear is, look, they, they thrive on fear. It's one of the reasons why in political debates, you know, often conservatives will try to argue by appealing to your brain. You know, we'll put up a... <laughs> pie chart and say, if you look at the long-term actuarial soundness of the Social Security system, there are clear factors in jeopardizing it. Green eye shade on. Whereas liberals tend to just point to someone and say, he wants to eat your children. <laughs> they go for the heart. Now, between the two, the heart is often the most effective. Now, what's most effective, I think, is going for the brain and the heart, going for values people care about, but also using logic and reason that, hey, if you want to lift people out of poverty, of course we want to lift people out of poverty. The reason I'm a conservative is the American free enterprise system has been the greatest avenue to lifting people out of poverty the world has ever seen. And so that combination is powerful. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you. But uh, I wanted to share something similar to where, where you're going right now. Yeah. Uh, this is actually coming from, from uh, Dennis Prager, but I would like to see us start using it. And he said that because of the fact that they go for the heart and we go for the brain, we're not afraid to listen to their logic because they have none. Yep. They are afraid to listen to our logic. Yes. That's yes. why their upper ups tell their people, don't listen to them, shout them down. Yep. His suggestion was, if you have a friend who's a liberal, make a deal with them that you'll listen to anything they say for a month if they'll listen to anything you say for a month and trade a podcast. It's a great idea. Okay. <laughs> and what I would love to see said is we're not who you're being told we are. Yep. Educate yourself. Take a month and listen to somebody else. And if you won't take a month, take a week and listen to some of these uh, commentators and find out for yourself who we are. Yep. They're telling you who we are and it's yes. not true. Look, I, I, I think that's a great point. And there's an amplifier to this. You know, one of the things the left did starting in the 60s is they seized the organs of transmissions of ideas. So whether it was K through 12 education, or universities, or journalism, or media, and by the way, or entertainment, the most powerful of all of them is entertainment. You know, think of Hollywood. When is the last time you saw a positive portrayal? of a business owner. I mean, listen, I'm happy if they're only a thief and embezzler. <laughs> because usually they're, in fact, mass murderers. You know, they're poisoning the water and killing children. I mean, think about, look, in our lives, think about the heroes we see that go and start a business and provide opportunities and, and help people climb the economic ladder. Hollywood glorifies none of that. Um, they're very good at conveying their narrative. And what we've got to do is find avenues to go around, to go around the gatekeepers. So, so look, this election, my opponent, Congressman Beto O'Rourke, will get between now and election day tens of millions of dollars of free media. Their favorite adjective for him is kennedy S. Usually with his hair blown. <laughs> and, and, and you read these these profiles of, of reporters who, I mean, it, it, it's it's like a, you know a groupie writing a profile of a rock star. But still, my beating heart. That's who the media is. 
That's the story they will tell. But, but we've got an advantage, which is truth. Here's the basic dynamic in Texas and nationally. Conservatives win when we effectively articulate what it is we believe. Right. Liberals win when they effectively obfuscate what they believe. Mm -hmm. Now, why as well? <coughs> You've got a socialist country right now employed every one of the principles you say you want that is collapsing. It was one of the wealthiest countries in Latin America and is absolutely crumbling under the manifest failures of socialists. And one thing that is really potent also, I, I want to say especially all the young people here, you have a voice that's powerful because you don't have to wait till you're 30 or 40 or 50 to speak out. You have a voice right now with your friends, with your classmates. And frankly, you have more credibility than I'll ever have and than, than people of an older generation will ever have. You have more credibility. Use that voice. You know, many of you have avenues to speak on social media. Use humor. You know, laugh, have fun. My advice to young people is typically two things. Defend liberty. Liberty is powerful, it's contagious. It's, it's, for young people, young people are often seduced by socialism because, you know, hey, free stuff, who doesn't like free stuff? You know, if I, if I asked you, all right, you want me to give you one of these cars, who would say no? <laughs> so, I mean, that's their basic message, is we're going to give you free stuff, and where exactly all this magic free stuff comes from, don't bother me with hard questions. I'm giving out free stuff right now. But a government powerful to give you everything is powerful enough to take everything from you. You know, there's an old line that someone who robs Peter to pay Paul can always count on the support of Paul. <laughs> but for young people, the basic message, why would you want Washington running your life? Liberty is a powerful, powerful value. I would encourage you to spread that. Look, most of the folks here are, are homeschool families. Who wants the government telling you how to raise your kids, how to educate your kids? You ought to have the freedom. That's, a, that's the most fundamental right. And it's all about freedom. And then the second thing is have fun. Think about it, that the media wants to portray concern as dour, angry, mean. <laughs> I assume if someone took a picture of that, that'll, be, that'll go on. <laughs> I, laugh at yourself. Yeah, you know, I just told a story this morning. I was on Twitter, I don't know, a few weeks back, and someone's Twitter handle was Ted Cruz Ain't My Baby. <laughs> and I really wanted to send a tweet to that person that just said, he was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, look, the left doesn't know what to do. If you, if you laugh and have fun and if we're happy warriors. And by the way, that is an enormous contrast. When they're screaming, angry, snarling. Now, mind you, the media is portraying us as that while well, they're the ones doing it. If we're happy and joyful warriors, that, that is a powerful, powerful contrast. Yeah. As a uh, young conservative, who do you suggest we uh, listen to, podcasts, things like that, um, to develop and, and further most of our ideas so we can really get a good grasp on it? So let me ask you, who do you listen to now? Uh, ben Shapiro is my big, my big guy there. Ben Shapiro, Craig Review, those. So, look, I think Ben is fantastic. Uh, ben is a, a good friend. He's smart. He's creative. I, I, I would certainly recommend him. I think Prager is another one who's very smart, who's thinking, who's pressing forward. And gentle uh, and calm. Huh? And gentle and calm. Oh, it, 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 I mean, he's, he's, you always learn something from Dennis. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, both Dennis and Ben are good friends of mine. I call him my second rabbi. <laughs> it, it, uh, you know, I try to read diversely. So, so I don't, you know, I try to, you know, I look at a lot of things on Drudge, I look at a lot of things on Twitter, I'll click on left and right, 
and, and try to, you know, one of the problems of social media is it drives everything to the extreme. Mm -hmm. you, you gotta be careful not to think social media is the real world, right. because it's sort of the real world on steroids. It, it's, it's useful for getting a sense of some trends on one side or another, but it's not, it's not a snapshot of where, we, where we, real people are. Um, And it's harder as a conservative to learn the facts. Because so much of what the mainstream media does is fact free. And so I, I doing the research to drill down. Now, one of the great things about the internet is it's democratized politics. You know, it used to be look, when I was growing up, there were a handful of networks, and you relied on the Walter Cronkite giving you the news. That's a very different world now, where everyone here can be a reporter. And everyone here can drill in and learn facts. Um, you know, a pivotal moment that for the young people, you guys won't remember this, but your parents will. Dan Rather was <laughs> at the top of the world of journalism, was the, the anchor on the evening news and he was taken down by a bunch of bloggers who found out that he was fabricating what he was doing. And it was bloggers in pajamas. That was the big phrase at the time. But it was a powerful indication of power moving, moving to the people. So even though the gatekeepers have their own ideology, every one of us has the ability to check them, to catch them, I will say, right before I walked in, I tweeted a story. It was a great story about Anthony Hopkins and Alcoholics Anonymous and, and reaching out to God to overcome addiction. So I tweeted something like, you know, powerful testimony of, of God's healing grace and, and the good work of AA uh, to overcome addiction. But unfortunately, I misspelled addiction and it's instead said to overcome addition. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first comments back was, addiction. And I was like, oh no, I've lost the, the, the math teacher's vote. <laughs> so I promptly deleted it and, and replaced it with addiction. But that was, uh, I, you know. Right. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm going to blame it on autocorrect. I don't know. It may have been my typo. It might have been autocorrect. I don't know, but it was the wrong word. I'm curious about the momentum in the rest of the state, because obviously Austin is Austin. Yeah. Um, and so we see what we see around here, and I'm curious what you're seeing in the rest of the state. So good news and bad. Listen, Austin has worked into a frenzy. Um, if you look statewide, Travis County is the base of support um, for Beto Rock. And, and listen, there have always been a ton of liberals in, in Travis County. Right. That's, that's, that's why we jokingly call it the People's Republic of Travis County. <laughs> um, I point out to other bright red counties like Denton and Collin and Tarrant, hey, look, you guys need to turn out to counteract all the liberals that are going to show up in Travis County. Now, there are a lot of good, strong conservatives here, too. You're, you're outnumbered, but it does make you sturdier uh, when, you, when you're withstanding uh, criticism and abuse. Across the rest of the state, the hard left is energized. And we're seeing this all over. We see it in Houston, we see it in Dallas, San Antonio. The hard left, part of it is, you know, normally in a general election, Democrats in Texas, they at least pretend to run to the devil. They, they at least pretend to be moderates. Uh, that's not happening here. Congressman O'Rourke is running hard, hard left. He's running like Bernie Sanders. And, and, and they made a decision, it's clear Democrats in Texas and nationally have made a decision that this is, there are typically two types of elections. They're what are called persuasion elections and turnout elections. A persuasion election, you're battling for a handful of voters in the middle, swing voters, and trying to convince them one way or the other. I don't think this is a persuasion election. I think the set of swing voters, the voters who are going to show up and vote, but who haven't decided D or R, is almost non-existent. In this deeply polarized time, most people pick the side right now. And it's clear the Democrats agree with me on that. They're not running a campaign trying to persuade anyone of that. 
What they are doing is trying to find every liberal in the state of Texas, excite them, energize them, and get them to show, show up. So, you know, running through policy positions. Uh, Congressman O'Rourke voted no on the tax cut and wants to raise your taxes. He wants to bring back the Obama job-killing regulations that hammered Texas, that hammered oil and gas, that hammered farmers and ranchers. He wants to go back home. Uh, on health care, he supports expanding Obamacare into full-on socialized medicine and putting the government in charge of your health care. Uh, on the Second Amendment, he's tweeted out how proud he is that he has an F rating from the NRA. <laughs> not a D minus, not a D, an F. I retweeted it. <laughs> I think elections are about choices. If you want a big government gun-grabbing liberal, well, the Democrats are giving you one. Um, on immigration, there is no starker divide of any two candidates in the country on immigration than this Senate race here. So in this race, I, I am proud to have been endorsed by the National Border Patrol Council. That, that is the union of the Border Patrol agents, of the men and women who risk their lives defending our border and keeping us safe. And they usually stay out of elections. Look, they're a labor union. They normally stay out of elections. Their sector presidents all flew down to McAllen to endorse me because they said out of 100 senators that I was the one leading the fight to stand with them and secure the border. On the flip side, Congressman O'Rourke doesn't want to build a wall. He says we should tear down the fences and walls we have on the border. He supports sanctuary cities. He says he's, quote, open to abolishing ICE. And when pressed on that, he doubled down and said, well, maybe we should also abolish the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, those are extreme positions. On Israel, he has the most anti-Israel record of any Democratic Senate candidate in the country. So when Hamas was raining missiles down on Israel, Congressman O'Rourke was one of eight, eight members of the House to vote against funding Israel's Iron Dome missile defense. Virtually every other Democrat voted for it, but just the fringe, far, far left, eight out of 435 voted no. When that happened, someone on Twitter tweeted, thank you for not supporting Israel's atrocities. Beto O'Rourke retweeted that. And then 37 minutes later, deleted the retweet. I guess he got second thoughts about <laughs> saying that publicly. And he is the only Democratic Senate nominee in the country to come out explicitly for impeaching Donald Trump. To say flat out, he would vote yes to impeach Trump. Despite all of that, he's the number one Democratic fundraiser in the country. And because of all these... And he is outraising us substantially. So last quarter, Q2, we raised $4.6 million. That's the most of any Republican senator. We are working hard to raise the funds to win this race. He raised $10.4 million. Same quarter, $4.6 versus $10.4. More than two times as much. And it's coming from the far left. I guarantee you when he came out and said he would vote to impeach Donald Trump, in the 72 hours that followed, I guarantee you, he raised millions of dollars from liberals all over the country. So where is Texas? Texas is, the left is energized, they're going to show up in record numbers. Our task is make sure conservatives show up. If we do that, we'll be fine. Uh, and so I think that's going to happen. I believe we're going to get the job done. But I also think this race, you know, in 2018, I feel a particular responsibility because I'm at the top of the ticket. If we do our job and turn conservatives out, that will positively impact congressional races, state legislative races, judicial races. We'll do fine up and down about it. If we don't do our job, if conservatives stay home, not only do we have trouble in this race, but we have trouble in races up and down the ballot, and we could lose this state. And so part of what we have to do is instill the urgency in freedom-loving Texans that, that, that freedom doesn't defend itself. Yeah? Uh, 
Would you say conservatives today struggle more with recognizing the flaws in the left's arguments or with misunderstanding the strength in our own? Hmm. Um, the interesting part of that question is the word conservatives. Let me take that out and put Republicans in there. Because if it's Republicans, I would say both. Um, I, I saw a friend of mine who tweeted once, he retweeted someone actually just, I think, yesterday, who said, when I die, I want all my pallbearers to be elected Republicans. So the GOP can let me down just one more time. <laughs> that's all right, that's fine. <laughs> um, look, there's a reason we're called the stupid party. Um, we most elected Republicans don't do either. They don't focus on the weaknesses of the other side's argument, and they don't effectively focus on the strengths of our own. You, you look at, for example, okay, one, one of the most frequent narratives that the media will tell and Democrats will tell is that Republicans are all racist. They're all old, fat, white guys who hate everybody else. Um, and it's an absolute lie. Yeah. But it, it's based on cynical fear mongering. And, and, you know, it's interesting. If you look at the minority community, look at, look at the African American community, look at the Hispanic community, virtually every single big inner city in the sun has been under single party rule by the Democrats for 50 years. How's that working out? Their policies don't work. There's a wonderful article that came out oh, several years ago. It was a National Review. It's called A Tale of Two Cities. You were asking for things to read. This is a great one to read. It compared and contrasted Houston to Detroit. So in the 1950s, Detroit was a larger city, and it was a much richer city. Detroit was the Silicon Valley of the 1950s. It's where the, the big three automakers were. It was prosperous. It was booming. Houston was smaller. It was more of a cow town. And what the article does is it traces the arc of those two cities. As Detroit began implementing left-wing policies and the city's fate plummeted perilously. And Houston began implementing policies that encouraged small businesses and entrepreneurship and jobs and the city's fate, fate skyrocketed. And in the contrast is dramatic. Let me tell you, the, the reason I'm a conservative I believe, I've described many times my domestic political philosophy is what I call opportunity conservatives, which is that every policy we think about should focus like a laser on easing the means of the sound of the economic right. Basic difference between left and right. Both of us, by and large, want to see people do better. What the left wants to do is reach down, grab them, and physically move them up, give them stuff. Problem is it never, ever, ever works. To everyone who are parents here, let's say you have a first grader who's struggling with addition. I came out just an hour ago against addition, so <laughs> you have a first grader struggling with addition. How does it work if you do your first grader's homework every day? You're not helping your kid if you do his or her homework every day. Now, you may be giving them what they need right then, but they're not learning anything. The reason they're being taught addition is for them to learn it. What conservatives understand is the only way anyone's ever climbed the economic ladder is to pull himself or herself up one rung at a time. To take individual responsibility, to take ownership, to save, to provide, to have the dignity. You know what? I believe everyone in America wants to work, wants the dignity of going and having a job, wants the dignity of going home and looking at your kids and saying, hey, I put food on the table. I'm providing for my, for my family. That That is... I think a, a, a human drive to be respected, to have self-respect. You know, I think about when my dad was here in Austin in 1957. He came as a teenage immigrant, 18 years old, couldn't speak English. $100 in his underwear, washed dishes making 50 cents an hour. And I try to think about, all right, what are the policies that would help that teenage kid washing dishes be able to climb the economic ladder? His first job, by the way, 
reason is a dishwasher, you didn't have to speak English. You could take a dish, put it under hot water, scrub it, and you do that in any language. Now, he learned English really quickly. He was going to UT. So his second job was as a cook. Actually, for long-time Austin residents, you may remember the Toddle House. Uh, it's where TCBY is by the UT campus now. That's where my dad was a dishwasher. When he became a cook, he had learned enough English that he got promoted. He liked being a cook better. Cook paid 80 cents an hour. He liked that more. And you didn't burn your hands on hot water all day long. So his next job after being a cook, he was a teaching assistant at UT teaching math to undergrad. And his next job was as a computer programmer for IBM. And then he went on to start a small business with my mom, the oil and gas business. And today, my dad's a pastor. He travels, travels the state preaching the gospel. Now, look, that's the story of America. But the point here that's so important, none of that happens if you don't get that first job washing dishes. It's that first wrong that gives you the second, the third, and the fourth wrong. And so our message Freedom works, low taxes work, low regulations work, small businesses work, empowering people works. Putting government in charge does it. All right, let's do last question. Yeah. Three quick ideas. First, for those that are being riled up to vote for the other side, yeah. I recommend asking, do you enjoy being angry? <laughs> you, think you, you think you'll enjoy it in five years when you have a stress illness? Second. <laughs> I say this area needs an idea such as make Austin, Texas again. <laughs> Your competitor, I call him by his real name, or at least call him the man who calls himself Beto. You know, so I appreciate all three of those. I, I, I will say, you know, we did have some fun the, the day that Congressman O'Rourke won the Democratic primary. Uh, we, we put out a jingle uh, on the radio that, that was to the, to the tune of, if you're going to play in Texas, you better have a fiddle in the band. And, and instead it was, if you're going to run in Texas, you can't be a liberal man. <laughs> and, 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 and we had some fun and it included in it, in it some lines that, that said, uh, liberal, liberal Robert wanted to fit in, so he changed his name to Beto and hit it with a grin. And... Uh, you know, I have to say, we did actually a very small radio buy with that. But predictably, the Democrats and the press lost their mind and gave us about a million dollars of free media as they were playing it. But the beauty of it is they would play it, and then they'd use it to attack me. And they wanted to call me Ted Crick, because that's what, what the left wants to do. And listen, my name is Raphael Edward Cruz. I go by Ted. So they said, aha, you're making fun of him for a nickname. You use a nickname. But to explain it, they had, they had to have some build-up. They had to say, no, no, you've got to understand. O'Rourke is Robert Francis O'Rourke. He's Irish. He doesn't have any, any Hispanic at all, but he uses an Hispanic nickname. It's just not what he is. Cruz, on the other hand, is actually the son of an immigrant who came here with nothing. And they'd be like, okay, explain to me again how the Republican is really the Hispanic and, and, and it's the Democrat that's not. And it was the sort of thing, throw me in that briar patch. I'm happy. <laughs> for you to spend a million dollars of your time and energy telling that story. I'll tell you this, look. Our approach to politics, we're going to keep this race focused on issues and substance. You know, you look at, I went through kind of a litany of policy areas where Congressman O'Rourke's views are far to the left. My views are very different. I'm going to keep it focused on that. I've never liked it when people go down in the gutter. I'm not going to do it. It's one of the reasons why I proposed five debates. You know, that's never happened in a Texas Senate race. I'm the incumbent. I'm not supposed to be suggesting five debates. But I did because I think the voters deserve it, and I'm perfectly happy to have a contrast of his ideas that are, I think, radical and out of the mainstream versus my ideas that I think reflect who Texas is. And so that's how we're going to approach it. We're also going to have fun with it. So we may well do things like the radio jingle um, to have some fun, <coughs> but, but we're going to be lighthearted and happy warriors. And, and I just want to say the impact y'all are making is huge. And so thank you for standing up and, and fighting to defend your liberty, but fighting to defend my liberty and my kids' liberty. Uh, Senator, she had a question. You had a question. 
favorite book. So how old are you? You're five. So when I was five, my favorite book was Green Eggs and Ham. Do you like Green Eggs and Ham? No. Thank you, everybody. Woo!